Buenas tardes, buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por atender este ciclo de conferencias organizado por el Servicio Geológico Colombiano. Mi nombre es Héctor Mora Páez y voy a tener el placer de presentar al doctor Peter Mornar. So, I have the honor to make the presentation of Dr. Peter Mornar. Of, uh, without the adult, he doesn't need any presentation given his great academic experience, research, uh, worldwide recognition. In any case, I want to express bit my thanks on behalf of the Colombian Geological Survey and the Geological Community for their contribution to this series of conference. I must tell you that there are 340 people registered which show the interest in this topic. Welcome, Pete. The auditorium is yours. Thanks again. Holy, Holy cow. So I share my screen. And Hector, you promised that you would speak Spanish so you wouldn't embarrass me. But anyway, that's the way it goes. So, um, so I just have a photograph here, but let me uh, change my slide if I can. There we go. So my plan, and this is tentative and this can change. My plan is to give an elementary introduction to plate tectonics today. And I hope I will be able to finish within one hour, but if not, maybe we continue next week and then give another simple elementary introduction to basic mountain building and lithospheric geodynamics, and then become more technical, a lecture on gravitational potential energy per unit area, uh, a one on lithospheric, lithospheric flexure, the thin elastic plate, foreland basins, narrow mountain ranges, then vertically average lithospheric rheology. Most of what I will be discussing will be large scale, so I'm not worried too much about differences in the vertical structure. And then I want to use New Zealand as an example, not the Eastern Cordillera. I think the Eastern Cordillera is a good example, and I hope that someone will pursue this with more uh, enthusiasm than, than I can give it right now, or more uh, effort, I, but I have enthusiasm, as an example of vertically average lithospheric rheology and how seismic anisotropy and oblique convergence can be combined. Then mountain building crustal thickening, two aspects of this, critical wedges, where you have a narrow wedge of deforming rock, and channel flow, flow within the lower crust. And then a second on where the thin viscous sheet, where the entire lithosphere is treated as a viscous sheet. Finally, then uh, a role of mantle dynamics, how removal of mantle lithosphere and Rayleigh-Taylor instability might affect surface, uh, surface uh, tectonics, surface features. And then um, uh, paleo paleoaltimetry methods, how we try to determine past altitudes since past altitudes figure prominently in all of this with some examples. Now I could add a bit, give a summary of Eastern Asia where I've worked much of my life, uh, a summary of the Andes south of the equator. I know this better. I worked in Peru uh, 40 years ago and I, I, more of my work has been there. Uh, Western North America, and if people if people wanted, and if you don't, I don't worry, I won't be insulted. But I also could then um, drift into climate, closing of the Indonesian Seaway, ice ages, El Nino, the Great American Biotic Interchange, where Colombia figures in that, how high topography in Asia and how it has affected the Indian monsoon. And I've, be I've been asked to address crustal extension, lower crustal flow and core complexes. This will be a challenge. I have much to learn. So I suggest that if you have thoughts, if you think that some of these are not worth it, or you thought some of these were worth it, I ask that you send Hector a short note. Don't burden him with a lot, but maybe he could uh, collect opinions on this. Okay, so I wanted to start with a basic introduction to plate tectonics. And, and my goal here, since most of you 
no plate tectonics. My goal is to show this from the point of view of why it was difficult to find plate tectonics, where the mistakes were made, and how the mistakes, once they were solved, how they helped us. So this is a classic image uh, drawn by Isaacs, Oliver, and Sykes a long time ago, showing lithosphere over the asthenosphere. Lithosphere is strong, asthenosphere is weak, moving apart at mid-ocean ridges, mid-ocean ridges going through here, moving past one another at transform faults, and then one plate under thrusting another uh, where the convergence is asymmetric, symmetric on, at the ridges, asymmetric at trenches. And I'll cover, I'll cover these three aspects plus rigid plates, uh, I hope, um, today or by the time I'm finished. But let me just back us up to a reminder. Basic Earth structure, there's a core. The inner core is solid, a very solid, soft solid. The outer core is liquid, mostly iron. This is where we get our magnetic fields. And that's the most I will say about the core in, in for the next 10 weeks. The mantle is the most of the mass of the Earth, and then the crust is a thin layer on top. Uh, that's one way of dividing the Earth, crust, mantle, core. But another way is in terms of lithosphere and asthenosphere. Beneath oceans, you have some water. That's the ocean. You have a very thin crust, only seven kilometers. Lithosphere, the strong layer, roughly 100 kilometers thick or no more than that. And then the asthenosphere with a gradual boundary between them. Under continents, the crust is much thicker, 30 to 80 kilometers. And the lithosphere can be thicker, maybe as much as 250 kilometers, again, with this gradational boundary. And one last simple introduction. The crust and the mantle differ in composition. And the crust is less dense. The crust has more of the lighter elements like aluminum, sodium, potassium than the mantle. Mantle is more iron rich. The boundary between them is sharp, possibly as little as, uh, as 10 meters in places, but maybe uh, kilometers and others, but still sharp. The lithosphere includes both the crust and the cold uppermost mantle. And so it's strong. And the plates of plate tectonics consist of separate pieces of lithosphere. Remember, both crust and cold upper mantle. The asthenosphere is weak, and the boundary between them is gradual. It's not clearly marked. We often simplify, treat the lithosphere as a finite layer, and lots of my illustrations will do that, but one should never forget that the boundary is gradational. So I want to cover four parts. Seafloor spreading at spreading centers or mid-ocean ridges, as you have in places like this. Transform faulting, where the ridges are offset, but also in places where trenches uh, face in opposite directions. Subduction of one plate beneath another at subduction zones or island arcs. This is a mimicking of South America, not an island arc but still a subduction zone, and then relative motion of rigid plates of lithosphere. So just to remind you, seafloor spreading, I'm going to show an animation made by Tanya Atwater. She has many wonderful animations, and if you want these, just Google Tanya Atwater animations. You'll find her, and you can download these, both for a Mac and for a PC. They're separate, but you can get, uh, get either of them. And this is a simple cross-section. This is South America. This is Africa. This is the Nazca plate going underneath. And I think you probably all know this picture. The two plates move apart. New, new C4 floor forms at the mid-ocean ridge in the South Atlantic. As shown here, the plates move apart. New material comes in in this place. So uh, the key here um, in understanding this process came with what's called the Vine-Matthews hypothesis. Vine was a graduate student advised by a very young supervisor, Matthews, back in the 60s. And they, they knew quite a bit when they made their assumptions, uh, though what they knew was not widely known. And they made three key assumptions, that the seafloor spreading occurs, that is what we just saw, the seafloor moves apart at, at mid-ocean ridges. The Earth's magnetic field reverses randomly, not predictably, 
and approximately three times per million years. They didn't know the details, but they believed that, this, that the magnetic field reversed. And basalt, which is the uh, rock that forms at the seafloor, basalt, when it erupts on the seafloor, becomes strongly magnetized in the direction of the Earth's main field. These three assumptions underlay where they were going, and they, that, those three assumptions made a prediction that there would be narrow strips of seafloor parallel to mid-ocean ridges that should be magnetized parallel to the present field and opposite to it. So strips that are parallel, strips that are magnetized parallel and strips that are magnetized anti-parallel. They should see that. And although this paper was published later in 1966, it shows this effect quite well. We're looking at an area southeast of Greenland, southwest of Iceland, there's Canada, there's Great Britain, Spain over here. And the, the Reykjanes Ridge, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, comes down underneath this black line in the middle. These are magnetic anomalies. I will say a bit more in a minute. But you can see there are these stripes that are parallel to the ridge. And in fact, there's a symmetry about the ridge. They didn't know this in 1963, and this was wonderful news to them. But they knew that something like this had been observed elsewhere. I, I want to digress briefly into what's a magnetic anomaly. Um, we have the Earth, of course, we have a big main field, largely a dipole field. That is, it's a field similar to what one sees if one has a bar magnet, a piece of magnetized metal. So the magnetic field points in uh, towards the magnet in one direction, points away and at the opposite end, and one gets this kind of a field. The Earth's field is mostly a dipole generated in the Earth's core. It's largely, but not entirely, a dipole field. And I should say, when the field reverses, the Earth doesn't change, the Earth doesn't flip, this dipole field collapses, becomes very small, and then rebuilds in the opposite direction. So there's always a field. The field, when the dipole field vanishes, there's the non-dipole field, which is weak, but there is still a field. Now, uh, uh, the dipole field comes from the core, This and it's a vector, has direction, right? And also, though, we magnetize rock at the surface that produces magnetized bodies, and they produce anomalous fields. Delta B is the anomalous field. We think we know the, the main field of the Earth. What we measure is the sum of this main field coming from the core and this anomalous field. So we measure this. But in fact, we don't really measure the, vi the vector field. We do not measure the directions. We measure only the strength of the field. So we measure the absolute value of this, the, the magnitude only, not the full vector field. And the magnitude of this can, is the magnitude of the core, that part of the field coming from the core, which we know, and the anomalous field, the small one. This is much smaller than that. If we write this, expand this, this is the square root of the dot product of the main field, plus the dot product of the anomalous field, plus the, the it's not a cross product, product in vector space, but it's the dot product of the main field with the anomalous field. This is much smaller than that, so we throw that away, we write this square root in this way, and then we can rewrite this as the sum of the strength of the main field, which we know, plus the fraction of the anomalous field that is parallel to the main field. So this ratio, this is the vector for the main field divided by its magnitude, so this is a unit vector. We get only that, that part of it. The magnetic anomaly is the difference between what we measure and what we know, what comes from the core. So it's this product in here. It's not the total field. And this is important. I'm not going to go into how this is important, but what this means is, for example, the magnetic anomalies over a mid-ocean ridge at high latitude point in one direction. If you go over an equatorial region, they actually point in the opposite direction. So if we go back to this, the black shows positive magnetic anomalies. These are regions where the rock is 
magnetized parallel to the Earth's field, the part that comes from the core, and the white shows negative magnetic anomalies where the rock is polarized opposite to the Earth's field. And so this is a recording of normal, reversed, normal, reversed, normal, reversed, and so forth in here. Back in the 60s, it was only in the early 60s that the idea or the uh, evidence that the Earth's field reversed polarity came into existence. And this is a plot showing first geologic time on the horizontal, so the present, zero, one million years ago, two, three, four million years ago. And this is how this evolved with papers that were published over the years from 1963 to 1969. And there's a rapid evolution of what, what you see. When it was first discovered, the possibility that the field reversed itself periodically on a one million year interval was, was plausible. By the time we got to 1969, many more reversals had been discovered. And I want to take you through both um, how this is wonderful, but also of a mistake that was made that proved to be quite illuminating. The first really convincing study that uh, seafloor spreading occurred after Vine and Matthews published their work came from Pittman and Hertzler in 1966. And they looked at a bunch of profiles. These are ship tracks shown here in a region near the East Pacific rise in the South Pacific. And in particular, the Altanen 19 profile shown here is, is the one that everybody got excited about. The story here is that Walter Pittman produced this, and then he produced another version in a, on a mylar sheet so you could see through it. And by mistake, he left the mylar sheet upside down. And when he looked at this and the reversed image of this, the symmetry was very, very convincing. And that uh, set him going on what he did. So this is a profile of magnetic anomalies, the magnetic field minus the Earth's field as we know it, but of course the anomalies are components that are parallel to the present field. And this is a model calculation where what they've done is assumed normal polarity under the seafloor in this black region in the middle, then reversed in white, normal, long reverse period, normal, shorter reverse period, and so forth. And, and you get this pattern of positive magnetic anomalies over normally reversed, normally polarized uh, bodies at depth. This was done in 1966, uh, in December, actually, 1966. So they, they knew of this event. They knew a bit what was going on, but there's much they didn't know. So they could correlate this with what's called the Jaramillo event. I'll come back to this later. They could correlate this one with what's what's known the Gilso or the Olduvai event in here. That that was clear enough. And they could correlate, correlate these two peaks with this spread of normally polarized uh, rock with a short interval of reversely polarized material in between. If you go back earlier, that wasn't known. They wouldn't have seen that. What they didn't know at this time, this was 1966, was that this little bump actually had could now be assigned to a magnetic reversal. By this time, 1969, it was clear that these two green blocks were not two green blocks, but three green blocks. And the same is true of that over there. And I might point out that that little bump and that little bump correlate with this and this, just as those do over there. They didn't know that, and this didn't come become known until quite a bit later. Well, what you could do, and Vine, um, picked up on this, uh, what you could do is, is use the time scale to get a rate of seafloor spreading. So you could correlate, for instance, the outer edge of this normal, normally polarized uh, material, correlate that with that, this little piece with this interval, and then correlate these others. And what he found in 1966 was you got a fairly constant rate of seafloor spreading. 44 millimeters per year. The, the, the point is the distance that you went out and the time of the reversals, or I should say the distance here and the ages of the reversals there, they fell on a straight line. And this was a this was actually, I'm sure, a big surprise to Vine and, and quite an important result. 
Uh, the reason it's important is, remember, this Jaramillo event was discovered in 1966. If Pittman had worked earlier, he wouldn't have been able to do what he did. And this is clear uh, from work that Vine did. This, this Remember, the Jaramillo event is a period of normal polarization, but that means there has to be a reversed period between it and the main period of normal polarization in here. And I mention this because we go back a year, one year, 1965, Vine, same Vine, Wilson, you'll hear much more about him, wrote a paper in here. And Walter Pittman used to say that Fred Vine was not very proud of this paper. And there's a simple reason. They were looking at the Juan de Fuca Ridge, which lies west of uh, California, Oregon, and Washington in the Pacific Ocean. And they had this profile. Don't worry about this bump in the middle. That can be explained. I'm not going to talk about it. But clearly, they've got a, a central region here. The, mid, the middle of the ridge is right in the middle here. They've got a central region that's normally polarized. So they have a model. They make that normally polarized. And they get something that looks a lot like that. Then they have a, re a reversely polarized region and then a normally polarized. So they put a block in here to make their model. They don't quite get it as tall as, the, as it should be, but let's not worry about that. And so forth. They match this with this. They match this, again, this calculated anomaly over this normally polarized material with this feature right in here. Now, at that time, the time scale looked like this. There was no Jaramillo event. And so this period of time, this short distance in here between this normally polarized material and this next normally polarized material had to be explained by a long period of time. This was the next normally polarized interval. So this was correlated with that. And similarly, they had these two bumps, these two normally polarized intervals, because that's what they calculate to fit that, to fit these data up in here. There's a long period of time, but there's only a short interval of, the, sorry, there's a long distance between them, but there's only a short interval of time. So for this section in here, they have a short distance, but a big duration, so they get a low spreading rate. Out here, they have a short, out here they have a big distance, but a short duration, and so they get a high spreading rate. This is 1965. If you then come to a more modern time scale, the Jaramillo event is here. You correlate it with that and with that. This, the Olduvai or Gilsa event, you correlate with this one. Everything makes much more sense. The time scale that Vine used in 1966 looks like this nice straight line. The time scale that came from 1964 there was none published in 65, and that Vine and Wilson used in 1965 did not include the Jaramillo event. It's this time scale up here. And so they got a very irregular history of seafloor spreading. This is what's wonderful about this is that, that when the history of the reversals became known well, and that's between 1964 and 1966, the spreading rates turned out to be nearly, remarkably, but nearly constant, not, of course, not exactly constant. This was a, a big event that, that really made everything simple. So the Jaramillo event, which was present in March 66, but not in, the, in, in, uh, in, the, in 64, and Vine and Wilson did their work in 1965, uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't have seen that. Well, that's just the last, this covers just the last four million years. There are magnetic anomalies all around the world. They're much older. And I'd show you a map just, just to show you a big ocean. Of course, this is South America, Chile over here, New Zealand. The L10 and 19 profile is this profile in here, the one that was so important. And I showed you only a short segment of it. But there were plenty of other profiles. And so this is now a plot looking within, within 10 million years of the mid-ocean ridge centered at the central anomaly. So this is the North Pacific. This is that Juan de Fuca profile, in fact. And uh, again, in the uh, South Pacific, this is the L10 and 19. This is the L10 and 19 reversed. 
And what Pittman, Heron, and Hertzler did was just give these numbers. There were many, many, many magnetic anomalies, and they wouldn't give all of them numbers, but they chose. And let me give you one example, anomaly three. This is called four-finger jack. You see one finger, two fingers, a stub of a finger here, and then a big finger there. You come down here, and there it is again. Two fingers and a stub of a finger, and there it is again. You come down here. Two fingers, a little stub of a finger, and another finger in here. You could see these all around the world. There it is again. There it is again. And this was true of the more easily identified magnetic anomalies. And this, of course, required that the seafloor spreading process occurred well before just the past few million years. If you went further out, this is anomaly five. It's usually well recognized. Between five and six and six and seven, it's often very hard to correlate these, they didn't. But if you get out, 12 and 13 have a big space between them. And this is true time and again. These are easily identified. These are ones we recognize. And if you go further out, here's 12 and 13, 12 and 13, 12 and 13, 12 and 13. You go out 21, 2, 3, 4, and then a big space, 25 and 26. And again, much closer together, 25 and 26, than 24 and 25. You see these all around the world. And I say all around the world, go further out, there's 25, 26, 27, big space between 25 and 27, 28, 29, and then a little, there's a short period of reverse polarity between 30 and 31, and you see that, you see that here, you see that here, you see that here. This is in the Pacific, you go in the Indian Ocean, and you see it, there it is, there, uh, get it right, there it is. So make sure I've got this right. No, no, you don't see it. Sorry, it's off over in here. But you again see 25, 26, long space to 27, as you do in the Pacific, all around the world. So there was no question that there were older magnetic anomalies. There's no question that these must have formed in the same way. But how do you date them? How do you determine the age? None of the dating techniques that used radiometric dating at this time were useful. You, first of all, you couldn't get material from the ocean floor of this age because it was buried in sediment. And second, even if you could, the dating would be too inaccurate for you to get a reliable age. So what do you do? How do you get back? Well, what was done was you get a big ship and you drill a bunch of deep holes. The deep sea drilling project, which started just a couple of years, uh, started in the late 60s, a couple of years before this paper was published in 1970, its third leg went to the South Atlantic, and I'm leaving out details, but the South Atlantic, it made sense to assume a constant rate of Atlantic Ridge in the South Atlantic. So this is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, of course, South America, Africa. The ship came out of Dakar in Senegal, drilled a hole here, and then it went down near the Mid-Ocean Ridge and drilled hole 14. And they drilled to the basement. They drilled to the basalt at the bottom. And then using the microfossils, the, the uh, plankton, the dead plankton that had accumulated in the bottom, which they could date, they got an age. And for site 14, they got an age of about 40 million years. And they drove closer to the ocean. So they got closer to the ridge. This is the distance from the mid-ocean ridge to site 15. And they got a younger age. And they drove to Site 16, even closer to being on the ridge, Site 16, and they got still younger age. And then they went the other way. Site 17 and 18, 17 is on the east side of the ridge, older, 18 closer, younger, and so forth. They got this line. What they found was that essentially a constant spreading rate. This was a, a, a well-known um, expedition because, of course, it showed seafloor spreading and showed nearly constant spreading rates over a long period of time, you're going back 80 million years here, this hole did not reach the bottom. And there were people who got on the ship who were avid, anti-seafloor spreading people. They were going on the ship to disprove it, and they all got off the ship convinced. Okay, uh, that's seafloor spreading. Let's talk about uh, fracture zones and transform faults. Uh, these were first recognized in the Pacific. So here's a map, Western North America. The Mendocino is the famous one. Fracture zones are big, long features that cross the ocean floor that are topographically disrupted. 
hence the word fracture. But they're long and straight, as seen by the features that are shown here in this, in this relief. Uh, they therefore were thought to be strike-slip faults. The seafloor across them usually has a step. The seafloor is disrupted, but the seafloor on one side will be shallower than on the other, so there'll be a difference in the depth. And these were known, these were discovered in the 1950s. In fact, these were so, so clear, with just a few ships crossings, the ships would cross this at maybe five or six places, but you could connect these. And there's a famous example of, a, of a, uh, an expedition where the chief scientist, Bob Fisher, came out of Acapulco down here, and they were heading to the South Pacific, and he went to bed at night, and they were on this side of the Clipperton fracture zone, and he got up the next morning, and he asked the captain where they were, and the captain said, we're down here. And Fisher went to the went to the record of the ocean floor, the echo sounding record, and the seafloor was completely flat. And he said, impossible. We cannot be south of the Clippert in fact, fracture zone, even though it was not mapped in this detail. They had an argument and you never tell a captain he's wrong. Captains are always men. You don't tell him he's wrong because they don't like that. But on this occasion, fracture zones one, fracture zones were right. Fisher was right. The captain had made an error in navigation. Now move forward. This is now early 1960s. Vaquier said, well, let's go out. If it's a strike slip fault, let's measure magnetic anomalies. And so they went out there. And I'm showing you just a few profiles. This is the Mendocino fracture zone where note the coordinates 165, 160. Now you south of it, the coordinates have changed. But north of the Mendocino fraction, anomaly 25, 26, big long space, 27, 20, 28, 29, 30, 31, and so forth. You see those. Go south of the fracture zone and you see 25, 26, 27 again, just north of this small fracture zone, the Pioneer fracture zone. But these are 1,140 kilometers apart. And then you go south of that into this space in here, and again, Anomaly 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. You see that again. Again, displaced another 280 kilometers. This is, this is a, a huge displacement and completely consistent with the idea that the fracture zones were strike-slip faults. I mean, this is kind of inescapable. If I blow this up and look at a more modern version of the magnetic anomalies, these magnetic anomalies, anomaly 27, you can trace all the way, all the way up, way up to the Aleutians, up in here, you can trace it all the way through. These, these magnetic anomalies cover a huge area. And you have this add 1,140 to 280, you have 1,420 kilometers of left lateral offset between the magnetic anomalies that are very clear as you can see here. And of course, every geologist has an image of what happens during an earthquake. The 1906 San Francisco earthquake, the most important earthquake for seismologists ever, there's a right lateral offset of this fence. This fence used to be aligned next to that right there, offset in a right lateral sense. San Andreas Fault going through, Ber um, um, through Berkeley, California, the fault comes along, offsets the curve, it continues out. This is, this is common sense to all geologists, certainly to earthquake geologists. So is this saying that you have 1,140 kilometers of left lateral offset across here? This is an undeniable, inescapable conclusion from the point of view of how geologists saw the world in 1961. Okay, uh, I, let's, let's go to another part of the world. Let's look in the South Atlantic. There are big fracture zones across this, the equatorial part of the South Atlantic. Fracture zones in this part were discovered almost a decade after fracture zones were discovered here, but they were discovered and they were recognized. And if I blow up a small part, so this is one of these big fracture zones just going off the top in here, the white lines are the segments of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the spreading centers, the axes of the spreading centers. The fracture zones are these big topographic features going across in here and here. Uh, we'll talk about transference faults being in between, but 
when you have a picture like this and you remember a picture like that and you have a picture like that does isn't the conclusion automatically that in here this ridge crest used to be aligned with that and it's been offset in a right lateral sense it's a right lateral offset of the ridge crest it's right lateral strike slip you're just moving that across in that direction and this is what the the early pictures did show well then along comes tuzo wilson tuzo wilson i contend if tuzo wilson had been born 50 years before when he was born he probably would have been on stage in the theater because he was quite a showman he was very good at presenting his ideas of things and he said well, suppose you do have a spreading center and you're moving material apart at the spreading center as shown by these arrows and you have another spreading center and you're moving material apart. Well, in between, you'll have strike slip, but it will be, in this case, left lateral. The, the, the plate to the north will move to the left relative to the plate to the south. And the fracture zone, which, is, uh, which continues out to the edges, this part of the fracture zone will be inactive. It will cease to be active when this part of the seafloor moves past the ridge, and this part will cease to be active. This was his suggestion, and, and he, ca he cast this as the difference between transform faulting and transcurrent faulting, where you can have offsets of the ridge crests of this sense or of that sense. Transcurrent faulting, sorry, transcurrent faulting the fault would go all the way across as the San Andreas fault does here, offsetting this curb. It would move the ridge from there. Whereas with transform faulting, you'd have the opposite sense of, of motion in here. Well, this, this was a testable hypothesis because the transform versus transcurrent faulting made two predictions, two big differences. If earthquakes define an active fault, then the seismicity should be between the ridge axis, in this case, only in this segment. But if, if you had transcurrent faulting, you should have seismicity all along the entire fracture zone, all along these features, not confined just to the central part. And second, obviously, you'd have opposite senses of slip. Here you'd have left lateral, here you'd have right lateral, here right and here left. So along, so at this point, how can you test this? And fortunately, the worldwide seismograph standardized worldwide standardized seismograph network had been uh, installed, and one could study earthquakes that occurred in places like this. So just to back you up, imagine if you have an explosion here. All the rock around the explosion moves away from the explosion when that occurs, and therefore the P wave. The P wave that's radiated away from the explosion, its first motion will be away from the source. It'll be, it'll be away from the explosion itself. In wherever you are in the world, the P wave will be first move away. If you had an implosion, you'd have the opposite. Well, with an earthquake, if you have slip on a plane shown here, the material in this quadrant will move toward the source. The material in that quadrant will move away Similarly, over in this quadrant, you'll move away, and over here, you'll move toward the source. And it's important to think about this at places that are far from the source, not right near the source. So if you're on this auxiliary plane in the perpendicular to the plane that slipped and perpendicular to the direction of relative motion, there'll be no P wave at all because the motion is, is, is uh, transverse. If you're far away from the source and you're out in this direction away, the P wave radiated above the plane and below the plane shown here, they will tend to cancel one another. And so you'll have a very weak P wave in this direction. The maximum amplitudes will be in the, in the 45 degree quadrants in here. So if we can measure these, we can determine the nature of faulting that occurred during an earthquake. And this is what Sykes did, in 90, published in 67. Uh, this is a lower hemisphere diagram of the stereographic projection. So the middle is straight down, and the ring around the edges is the horizontal distance to the east, horizontal direction, not distance, to the east, to the north, to the west, and the south. And the black dots show first motions that are away from the center, moving outward initially, sorry, moving outward, 
And these are where the first motion of the P wave is towards the earthquake, towards the center of the picture here uh, in the middle. Again, outward in this case, P wave initially moves away. And then in this case, inward, the P wave initially moves towards. And so these data imply slip on a plane. It's nearly vertical, trends east-west, and it would have right lateral strike slip. It could mean a plane that's nearly north-south and with left lateral slip movement in the opposite sense. From this information alone, you can't tell. But when Sykes did this, the fault plane solutions for the mid-Atlantic Ridge, they all showed right lateral slip, consistent with transform faulting for earthquakes in here. Moreover, the seismicity is confined between segments of the mid-Atlantic Ridge. The seismicity is in here, not out here in the fringes. It's between the ridge crests as in here or as in here. Exceptions do exist. That earthquake is not. Uh, this earthquake is an exception. But in general, the earthquakes are between the segments of the mid-ocean ridge. So this confirmed transform faulting. But I hope you appreciate that understanding fracture zones and transform faults required undoing geologic common sense. I've taken the San, Fr San Francisco offset that's right lateral, and I've inverted the photograph here so that it's left lateral, so it looks like this over here. So these are both wrong. This is not left lateral slip here, and this is not left lateral slip in San Francisco. Here, because I cheated here, because we now understand what was going on. Okay, uh, I'm now going to talk about um, uh, subduction. The first clue with subduction, maybe not the first clue, but a very important clue came with George Plafker's work after the great earthquake in 1964 in Alaska. So here's a map of Alaska. And the earthquake caused surface deformation over quite a large area, hundreds of kilometers long along the coast. Anchorage, the main city, would be right in this area. And a blow up of this, this region shown outlined in here, emerged after the earthquake. Lots of ground that had been below sea level emerged in this area. And this area back over here uh, um, subsided, went below sea level. This went down. In a profile, a profile drawn across, you have subsidence in the backside over here, and you have emergence over in here. And Plafker recognized that the way to do that was slip on a gently dipping fault. Um, the folks at Caltech, I got this from Jean-Philippe Avoac, uh, made a nice animation, which I'll show you here. I'll show it to you twice, but what's going to happen is the ocean plate sub, um, uh, subducts underneath. It drags the overlying plate down. The earthquake occurs. Everything springs back, and, uh, and the surface topography changes. So you have slow. The island is subsiding. You're moving the plate down underneath the coast. This part is locked. It's not slipping. It's going to rupture in an earthquake in just a second. Springs back. This then emerges. The tsunami, the water goes away as a tsunami. This has emerged. This has come out of the water. And this region has submerged. It's gone down underneath. If we, I'll run this again. And if you watch that area, it's much more subtle than what I showed. But this is slowly... Um, this is slowly emerging uh, during the buildup of this. This is coming up ever so slightly. And then when the rupture occurs, it'll settle back down. It drops down, you see, and this then becomes uh, filled with water. This was a, a, an important study. Plafker um, was a very independent guy and uh, uh, was in the right place at the right time to do some beautiful work. The usual image we have of subduction zones is that there is a seismic zone that dips down underneath. It dips at a gentle angle near where the trench is and near where the volcanoes are, dips at a gentle angle, and we know there's thrust faulting in here. We have now thousands of, of fault plane solutions that show this is going on. And this was recognized in the 60s as well. In addition, if one looks in detail, at the trench in this area, whoops, looks in detail, the top surface of the trench is broken by faults, and these are normal faults. So this has been stretched as it bends. The seafloor bends as it comes down in here, and the top surface stretches. And in fact, there's another more subtle feature. This, this is a map, Kamchatka from Russia, 
Hokkaido and Honshu in Japan and the Kuril Trench. These are two profiles. You have this outer topographic rise. This is, this is clear. It's not a very big feature. We're looking at just a few hundred meters. Um, but the, what's happened here is the, the oceanic lithosphere is bent down at the trench. Its top is stretched, but seaward of the trench, it's flexed upward. And you can see that with just a piece of paper. If you take a piece of paper and dangle it over the edge, here the edge of the window sill, you can see the, the paper is flexed up. And it's not flexed up very much, but just to show you the difference, if you put some heavy weight on top of it, this, this is a heavy weight that I happen to select at random, you flatten out that surface and you do away with that. There's no geological analog to this heavy weight. I'm just showing you this as as a, dem a demonstration that that flexure is that fle up flex here is because of the way the plate is bent bent down, and we know this from earthquakes. Earthquakes show that the top surface is stretched, but we have deeper earthquakes that show that it's it's compressed, essentially perpendicular to the trench down at greater depth. So this is a simple thin elastic plate stretched at the top and compressed at the bottom as it's bent down. So what about subducted lithosphere? We have subducted lithosphere down here. What's the evidence of that? And I want to take you from this map. This is the, um, the East Pacific rise over here. Go over here to the Tonga Trench in this part of the world. So the Tonga Trench is this deep area over here. The Tongan Islands are a series of islands that are mostly volcanoes, not entirely, not all of them are volcanoes. Fiji Islands to the west and Rarotonga. This is a cross section through this area. And there's a, a zone of intermediate and deep focus earthquakes that dips under Tonga. So this is an east-west cross section going down through this region. And what Oliver and Isaacs recognized back more than 50 years ago was that if they recorded earthquakes in Tonga, deep earthquakes down here, they recorded those with very high frequencies. And therefore, they had not been attenuated. The paths were low attenuation, or we would say high Q. And they postulated that this is because lithosphere had been subducted. If they recorded these earthquakes, these same earthquakes at Fiji, there were weaker signals with low frequencies, high attenuation, low Q, and therefore propagation through the asthenosphere. And the same was true at Rarotonga, much farther away. If we just look at seismograms just as examples, so Numate is in Tonga. It's a station over here. And this is a, the, the vertical component, the northeast and southeast components of seismograms recorded in Tonga from a deep earthquake someplace down in this area. The P wave is here, and you see very high frequencies. The bottom seismogram, um, when it, Vunikowai, I think, I can't remember, VUN is in Fiji over here, and the P wave is much lower frequency. You see what they're, they've had to outline it here. It's big, uh, but it's much lower frequency than what you have here. And the same is true of S. S is much higher frequency at the station in Tonga than at the station in Fiji. In Fiji, it's, it's much shorter periods. I should point out that time, that between this mark right here and this mark is one minute. So these time marks are about four seconds long. So these, these S waves are periods of one second or so, whereas these are many, many cycles. And these come later because the earthquake is actually closer to Fiji than it is to Tonga. This observation led Oliver and Isaacs to suggest that the entire lithosphere had been, uh, had been subducted underneath it was both high speed and high Q. Remember, high Q means low attenuation. The asthenosphere is low Q, high attenuation. So the asthenosphere would be in here. And this is a, is a, a window through the low Q uh, asthenosphere through which then these high frequency seismic waves could pass. And not only were they high frequency, they traveled rapidly. This is a plot now of travel time advances. This is how early the P waves, P waves down here, and S waves are here at stations in Tonga. Distance from the trench measured this way. So TFA is this station. 
Umate is here, and EUA is this station way over here. And what you see is, this is now from deep earthquakes. If the deep earthquake passes through some of the asthenosphere in here, it, it does not arrive as early as if it passes through lithosphere, confined entirely to the lithosphere. So these are early, and I should say, all seismologists would know, four seconds is very early. This is, you have to be extremely fast to have your arrivals four seconds early. And 11 seconds for S waves, again, is very early. So this high Q zone is also a high speed zone. And this has been now found in lots of places. This, this, this window of high Q into the asthenosphere explained a phenomenon that had puzzled the Japanese for a long time. The Japanese, having earthquakes all the time, were much more advanced in seismology than most countries. And in 1932, they knew that an earthquake, a large, large earthquake, had occurred at a depth of 300 kilometers. Most people in the world didn't believe earthquakes occurred that deep until somewhat later. But what was interesting about this earthquake was that the close stations, it was not felt. People living on a little island out there or over in here or all along in here did not feel this earthquake. But farther away, stations way down here, it could be felt and even strongly felt. And the explanation, which was not obvious until the subduction of lithosphere was clear, the explanation is simple. If you have an earthquake at 300 kilometers depth and it, the path goes up through the asthenosphere, the waves are attenuated so much that you don't feel it. But if the earthquake occurs here and the path is up the slab all the way to so that it does not pass through the asthenosphere, you can feel it. And so this nearby absence of feeling and sensing the earthquakes and farther away sensing them is simply due to this window of high Q. Um, so how does it get down there? Well, we, Benioff, Benioff is a famous North American seismologist who argued that these earthquakes, the, subdu the se seismic zone or that with deep intermediate and deep focus earthquakes that had been determined now, this was in the 40s, by Gutenberg and Richter, he said, well, these are big thrust faults that go down into the mantle. That was his argument, big thrust faults that penetrated down into here. This, these, these, uh, this is a cross section kind of through South America. These two are from South America through Peru and through Argent Chile and Argentina down here. Well, we can study that with fault plane solutions. Let me just briefly mention that in addition to determining possible fault planes from fault plane solutions, remember P wave first motion from an explosion is away with an earthquake, there are two quadrants where the first motion first moves away and two quadrants where the first motion first moves towards the, towards the earthquake. In addition to determining the planes, we also infer what are called P and T axes. P comes, uh, I, I don't like this, I don't think compression or tension are the words to use, but the P in compression, the T comes from extension. So this is the orientation of maximum compression and this is the orientation of maximum extension, or it would be deviatoric tension. So one can get those parameters. That becomes important in a second. But suppose Benioff were correct. One nodal plane would be aligned parallel to the plane of the seismicity, parallel to that. And the other plane would be aligned perpendicular to it and have the same strike. So the other plane would be perpendicular in this region. At greater depth, one plane would dip this way and one would dip the other way, as shown over here. This is, the red lines are showing the orientation of the plane that you would expect from the fault plane solutions if Benioff were correct, for the shallow, shallower, or the intermediate depths down to 300 kilometers, and the steeper example for over here. This is what Benioff would have said. If he were correct, one nodal plane would be aligned parallel. In fact, in general, both nodal planes are aligned at about 45 degrees to the plane of seismicity, and either the P or the T-axis dips down that plane. So in other words, what one gets from the fault plane solutions is either the T-axis, as shown here, is dipping down the plane, or could be the P-axis in this case, or at greater depth, the P-axis is aligned 
parallel to the seismic zone. And this is what we've observed time and again. This is a, a, a result that's uh, inescapable. So if one puts a summary of all of this together, of now fault plane solutions of deep focus earthquakes, uh, there are patterns that emerge. Where there are no deep focus earthquakes, such as under Central America or under Mexico or Sumatra or the Aegean, the T-axis is generally down dip or nearly always down dip extension as if the weight of the plate is pulling this down. Imagine a spring that you hang from the ceiling and you just let it hang. Well, it will stretch. It will extend parallel to the spring. T-axes are down dip. That's the pattern for them. Where the, where the earthquakes make a continuous zone all the way from the surface to great depth, as in Japan or in Tonga or the Marianas, what one finds is that the p-axes are down dip all the way, down dip p-axes, as if the slab is compressed along its length. It's as if you took a spring and you pushed it down on the floor and compressed it making it shorter. So the, the compression of the slab is parallel to the slab, and it's as if the slab has met some kind of resistance, high strength or maybe high density. Then there are these intermediate cases where there's a gap. There are, there are intermediate depth earthquakes, deep earthquakes, but there's a space between them under Chile, uh, under Java in this area. And one possibility is that the bottom of the slab is meeting resistance but the shallow part is still being stretched by the weight of the slab. So here you'd have a spring that hangs from the ceiling. Its upper part is stretched, but its bottom part on the floor would be compressed. This is a, a simple explanation that many of us like for these places where you have a gap in the seismicity. And often you have a minimum in the seismicity, if not a gap. An alternative al explanation, however, is that the slab broke off under Peru, for example, that the lithosphere broke and sank to the bottom. So the slab is compressed down dip at great depth because it's sitting on this heavy, on this resistant floor, but at shallow depths, not shallow, but intermediate depths, it's stretched by its weight in here. So um, Hector, I, I'm, it's now one minute of four, and I have another, I don't know, probably five or 10 minutes Maybe I should stop here, and then I'll just pick up here uh, um, next week. Is that what you suggest? I think so, that it is better to stop here in order to to have the coverage complete of the all your stuff. I think so. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, there, are, there are two questions, Peter. Uh, the first one is, in plate tectonics, what processes cause rollback in the slab? Ah, uh -huh. uh -huh. um, So let's see if I can find a slide. Rollback is not a term I like. Um, there, that'll be good. Rollback is not a term that I like to use. But I, what I think what you're asking is, if we imagine Fiji is fixed, uh, what we know is that Tonga is moving east relative to Fiji. And we know that the downgoing slab is not, relative to Fiji, it's not going straight down, it's sinking, it has a vertical component. And so people use the term rollback in the sense that this slab used to lie further, further west and now because it's sinking, it is rolling back. Uh, that, that this, um, this evolution is taking place. Rollback can be used sometimes to mean just the opening of this gap back in here. And I don't like the term for that reason because you can imagine two ways that you can make rollback happen. One, the weight of the slab pulls it down. So it relative to to Fiji, it does not move towards Fiji and down. Whoops, sorry. It, it has a vertical component and sinks so that this piece of the Pacific plate does not move to here, but it moves to there. 
and another piece moves to there and you move away and that's why you open up the basin. It would be just gravity acting on the slab. But the other possibility is that that's not what's happening at all. The forces that move plates are simply moving Fiji away from Tonga for some other reason and you're opening up this basin in here. And so you think that there is some rollback phenomenon, but there really isn't. I Maybe I misunderstood the question, but I hope I didn't, and I hope I was clear. Okay, Pete, the second question is, um, what relationship could be between the Milankovitch cycles and the magnetic anomalies of the oceanic crust? Oh, boy. Um, I don't think they're likely to be related at all. Uh, I, I, uh, oh, well, oh, uh, oh, well, okay. There are two answers. Um, there's the very simple answer that Milankovitch is due to precession of the Earth's uh, um, axis and, and, and tilting and has nothing, zero, to do with um, seafloor spreading or with the magnetic field. They're just independent phenomena. Actually, there are three possible answers. A second possible answer is that indeed, part of the reason we get a magnetic field is because of precession of the Earth. There was an outstanding applied mathematician who thought that this might be happening. I don't think that's likely. And then there's a third effect, and this could be real, and this is a different, but, um, and that is that Belankovich over the Ice Age time, uh, we've had ice ages. And when we've had ice ages, we've moved water from the ocean onto the land. And by moving water from the ocean onto the land, we've decreased the pressure in the sea floor over the mid-ocean ridges and melting, melting of rock, not ice, melting of rock and ice, but melting of rock depends on the pressure. And so the change in the pressure at the bottom of the ocean because of variations in ice on continents, which then follow Milankovitch cycles, the rate at which volcanic rock erupts on the ocean floor could vary with Milankovitch cycles. And in fact, the evidence suggests that it does. It's a bit of a surprise to me. So Milankovitch could write a signature on the volcanism, not probably not the magnetic field and almost surely not on the rate of seafloor spreading, but on the rate at which volcanic rock erupts at the surface. Okay, thank you, Pete. There is another question. What is your opinion about the Bucaramanga flat slab? Is this a result of a possible tour in the Caribbean slab or, or perhaps a fault too? So um, let me make sure I understand. Um, I know the Bucaramanga nest of earthquakes. I know that the Caribbean seems to subduct at a very gentle angle beneath northern Colombia and reaches to Bucaramanga. Uh, I also know that some people think that the earthquakes, maybe not in Bucaramanga, but south of Bucaramanga, are in Pacific lithosphere. I don't think that's the case. I think they are in Caribbean lithosphere that's been under thrust from the north. And why is it a flat slab? Uh, I, I, uh, I have two opinions. One is that it's got thick crust. Caribbean crust tends to be thick, and hence it may be more buoyant than uh, ordinary uh, oceanic lithosphere. And second, the Caribbean is old. It's, uh, it's, it, we don't know how old it is, I don't think, or at least I'm not. I don't know, but I've always thought that it's very old, and hence it's thick, and hence it's stiff, and doesn't bend very much, and so it, it underthrusts at a gentle angle. But 
if either of those is wrong, I won't be surprised. So the answer really is I don't know. Okay, thank you. I think I should stop sharing, right? I, I don't need to I don't need to show my pictures, do I? Mm, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, and please um, give me feedback. If this is too elementary, well, it's uh, it's too late now. But <laughs> if it was too elementary, then I'm I apologize. And uh, next week will be quite elementary, also. However, I would like to ask you if you have time for the last question. Sure. Okay. How can I explain the oblique subduction? Uh, I don't. Um, I don't think that I don't. There, there's no reason why it can't be oblique. Um, indeed, we think of the subductive slab as playing an important role in driving the plates, uh, but it's not the only process that drives the plates. And so, if you take the Aleutians, the most spectacular example of oblique uh, subduction, uh, before back before uh, the Pacific plate was subducting underneath the Aleutians, the, what's called the Kula plate was subducting under the Aleutians. It was subducting northward, perpendicular, essentially perpendicular to the Aleutians. And what happened was the entire plate was subducted. Uh, I should tell you Kula, the word Kula, Kula plate, the word Kula means all gone in Athabascan Indian. The Athabascan Indians live up in the north up there. So it was uh, borrowed from anthropology. Uh, so once it was gone, the only thing that could be subducted was the Pacific Plate. But the Pacific Plate didn't move normal to the Aleutian Trench. It moved obliquely. So it, it just had to continue in that direction. It, it's, a, it's a consequence of history, uh, but it's perfectly acceptable. And, and you have oblique subduction under New Zealand. It's the, the direction, it's it's almost, oh, it's maybe not half strike slip, but it's it's 30% strike slip. Okay, Pete. Uh, thank you very much for your nice explanation. I think that everyone is, is happy about that. So, muchas gracias a todos por eh, asistir a esta presentación del doctor Peter Monar. Estaremos mm, entonces dentro de una semana eh, en la segunda sesión. So I'll see you on next Tuesday, Pete, and thanks again very much. So, so could you and I have a quick talk before with the rest of them gone? Oh, yes, we can yeah. do that. So, because I need advice from you, is this is this too elementary? Is this uh, do I speak slowly enough to be clear? Are people understanding? I think that this is that is perfect. That is great. You think it's okay? Yes. So, so I'll then I'll pick up next week with just rigid plates and continue and uh, and continue in this way. Yeah, I think that that is the best way. Okay, I okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>